And I don't know if I said that. I was a pre-law major. I thought I was going to be an attorney. No, I clearly am not an attorney. Or a paralegal, to be the least. But I didn't, I wasn't any of those things. But I strolled into class. The teacher was the judge of Circuit Court 2 in Delaware County. And I won't say his name. He might have even passed on by now. But I walked in that day. And on the board, written across the whole board, a huge board, underlined, it said, the fair is in July. I thought, okay, what's this about? So he got up and he said that in no uncertain terms were we to ever use the word fair in his classroom. And he went on to say that life isn't fair and that every day he had to bring people in front of him or were brought in front of him, he had to make very tough decisions and that those were life-altering decisions. And in his statements that day, he seemed to imply that all he could do was make the best decision possible. But no matter what the decision was, someone was not going to be happy. Someone would say it was unfair. He also seemed to express kind of sympathetic a little bit for those lives that he knew would change for forever, but he had to make that decision. But I think he acknowledged that even in his mind, someone would go over unhappy. And perhaps maybe he felt like he was in a bad position because he had to be the decider sometimes of those tough things. I'm not sure about the full nature of his conviction. Uh, regarding fairness, but I will tell you, you never used the word fair in that classroom. Somebody tried once and it did not end well. <laughs> quickly rebuked. Um, he quickly said, remember the fair is a lie. So as I stand before you today, it's difficult for me to use the word fair. And as Jean can tell you, my children don't say that word as she shakes her head. It's kind of a game that we play. It's unequal. It's unjust. It's not right. It's inequitable, whatever word that we decide we want to use, but we don't use that word. It's kind of become like a curse word in our family. We just don't say it. But today in our scripture, we do find people saying what? It's not fair. They're questioning the justness of their treatment. They feel those who came to work in the vineyard late are unjustly receiving the same compensation as those who have worked in the scorching sun all day. And when the vineyard pays everyone the same, the owner pays everyone the same, those that work the least and those that were there first. I think the ones that were there first are explaining, and it really pains me to say it today, it's not fair. That's what they're saying. So what about us, friends? When we read the story, what thoughts come to our mind if we're reading this as if it's a modern-day parable? Can we sympathize with those that have worked in the hot sun? for the entire day, and how would this be received in today's context? Because if we look at this parable only from the lens of a, a fair day's pay for a full day's pay, if you will, I think we'll kind of miss the point of the parable. And I don't think this parable is well received if we think of it only in economic terms of today. If we think about life in the workplace, don't we see all types of disagreements in the workplace? Maybe some work hard, and some complain that others don't work as hard. Some work uh, not at all. And then you hear people saying, well, they're, they don't like handouts, or whatever the case may be. Perhaps people think they deserve more. They were passed up for a promotion. They should have got a raise in their pay. All those folks are probably saying, it's not fair. This is not right. Get overlooked in their jobs, perhaps. And we just can't stand it if a coworker is more enriched than we are. But I think it's, we miss the point if we look at it only this way. And it's not my point to discuss that in any more detail. I'm not a workplace expert, although all the stories I told you of the work that I have, maybe I could have been good in each other. But I think it's, if we look at workplace tension, that's not the point. So let's center it back in. We, we know Jesus is talking about the kingdom of heaven here. And we know that because when Jesus is going to make kind of a tough point in these parables, he always gives us the clue. The kingdom of heaven is like. My Father's kingdom is like. Pay attention. I'm going to give you the keys to the kingdom. And we see that here. The kingdom of heaven is like. And then he proceeds to tell the story. And many questions arise when we read the scripture and Bible study. They came forth. Somebody asked, well, were the people that were standing by, were they lazy? Were they slothful? It's a good question. Did they not want to work? Why did the vineyard and his assistant come back to the vineyard? Why did they keep coming back? 
Wouldn't it make more sense to hire everybody at the same time so that you get the most work done for the day? Doesn't make sense if we look at it in a modern day thinking. And so we could make all these assumptions, but the scripture really doesn't give us all the answers. But I do love what Feasting on the Word said this week about assumptions. And this is what I had to say. It said, assumptions are planned resentments. Let me say that again. Assumptions are planned resentments. When we assume we set ourselves up for disappointment, or even worse, when we assume we set those up that we're making the assumptions about to be the focus of our anger or of the disappointment. So assumptions can not be good in most cases. And as Feasting on the Word does, typically it says, here are maybe four good assumptions that the world should make. So here they are. Number one, God loves me and all creation deeply and profoundly. I and all others are made in the image of God. Number three, God's generosity is beyond our wildest imagination. And number four is there is nothing I can do to earn or deserve God's generosity. So I do appreciate these. Think about it. These were the only senses we made in life. Life would probably be a little easier. We'd probably get along a little better. But friends, this sermon is really about God's grace. The scripture, God's grace, mercy, and generosity. That's the focus of the scripture. So let's dive a little bit deeper into the parable. So the vineyard represents very clearly God's kingdom. The workers are God's people working in God's kingdom. And the parable does address an age-old question that hard-working good people have always asked. What kind of God offers the same reward to those who have earned it and those who others think haven't? So we might say, like we say in popular culture, those who have earned it, meaning those that have done the lion's share of work. And maybe those who haven't earned it in popular culture would be those who sit idly by. But when you ask the question, what kind of God rewards all the same? You have to say, for centuries we've said it's a just God. A God that is fair, if you will. But in order to say that God is just, we kind of have to understand what the vineyard represents. It's the opportunity. When we ask the question, does God treat everyone fairly? But feasting on the word said, and I agree, he said we're asking the wrong question. We should look at that the actual gift is the opportunity to work in the vineyard itself, to work in God's kingdom. That is to say God is just offers that to everyone. And as we work in God's kingdom, there's no room for pride. The only choices we have is we work for God's kingdom, or we do stand out of the and we waste away. And God doesn't wish for anyone's life to be wasted. That is not the nature of our God, not any day. So what does God do? God extends the invitation to work in and for God's kingdom indiscriminately and repeatedly. God keeps inviting us to work in the vineyard, to work in God's kingdom, and God shows no favoritism. All are equally deserving of the opportunity to work, and the reward for all those that work in God's kingdom is equal. This is about God's radical equality for all God's people. Rewards don't come from individual merit, not for the quality and quantity of our work, but rather from the covenant with the one who's doing the highlight. And friends, I say to you this morning, God is an equal opportunity employer. All are welcome to work in God's kingdom. And God promises and delivers one reward for all God's people. Now, ideally, those that work in God's kingdom in the vineyard, they should do it because it's the right thing to do, not because there's merit involved. And we see in the Bible, there's many stories that once people start working in God's kingdom, there's what? Grumbling. Feasting on the Word says from the Old Testament to the New Testament, grumbling has been a pastime of Christians. I wish I had that song I sang in these choir. Grumble on Monday, grumble on Tuesday. <laughs> people grumble when things they don't see that it's, that it's equal. But we have to be reminded that the real gift is God's mercy that allows us to work in the kingdom. That is the gift. So what about this last will be first stuff? We see it many times in the Bible, don't we? We see it in Luke, we see it in Mark, in Matthew, where Jesus is reigning against the holier than now religious leaders. Because this is a call to humility. I think on the call somebody said, or I felt maybe I needed to explain that God loves everybody, so why is this first and last? I think it's really about the heart of the humility. God likes those 
He, he looks first to those that don't think too highly of themselves. And those who are meek in spirit, God exalts. I was talking to my pastor friend and my mentor today, and he said, he's retired, he gets called to preach every now and then. He said, which one are you preaching on? I told him, he said, oh, the 11th hour scripture. He said, everybody calls us the 11th hour scripture. And I said, yeah, really? He said, yeah, but that's not really the point. I said, okay, what's the point? I knew what the point is because we were in Bible study. He said, no, it's about God's salvation. It's about mercy. It's about equal opportunity for all. And yes, those who do come to God in the 11th hour receive salvation, but that's not the true thrust in it. But it is true. The scriptures about God's grace and salvation are offered to all, regardless of when they enter the kingdom. That's an important point. Some are blessed friends to enter early on. Some like me entered early on and left and came back. I guess we could argue I was always there. I was just a little inactive. Took a little time off from the vineyard. But the grace of God goes before us all before we need it. And in the Methodist tradition, that's provenient grace. All grace is provenient. God acts before we know that we need God. And it doesn't matter who enters the vineyard first. It doesn't matter why all that grumbling occurs. But what does matter is whether you come in early, middle, late, is none of us should view that work as a burden. And we should work tirelessly and with gratitude in God's kingdom. And we should be blessed, feel blessed by that opportunity and mercy that God has extended. Once we've entered the vineyard, we must work for justice from the moment we're called until the day we receive that great reward that is equal. And notice in the parable, though, that all the workers started at the same place. They all were out of work that morning. And the vineyard owner came and he gave them all work. Yes, they came in at different places, but they all started the same. And it didn't really happen until they started working and they started grumbling. And all this talk about injustice happened. I think we, we must look at they did all start equal. And that's a call to many people start at different places in their walk and coming into the kingdom. And they were all paid equally. Until, and the grumbling didn't happen until people started taking notice of their positions, if you will. But then the, the vineyard owner asked, well, why are they questioning this generosity? I think you knew the deal, right? We know the deal. When we go to work for God's kingdom, it's an honor, it's a privilege. But there won't be days that aren't tough, that don't have us exhausted. But we know the deal, and we should be grateful. And God generously, as our loving God, lavishes us with mercy and grace all the days of our life. So I think this is definitely about gratitude and mercy and being thankful. And God continually invites people to the kingdom. That's why in the story, the vineyard and their assistant kept going back to bring new people into the vineyard, keep extending the invitation, and so it is with our lives. And so as we are the church, as we look to build our church, I think we must be ever mindful People come in at different stages. And our job as a church is to nourish and to love them and move them forward and remind them that there's grace for all, no matter when you came in. It's about hospitality, radical hospitality. So as I said, and I hope I've made the argument, we can't read this in modern economic terms. It doesn't make sense. You wouldn't hire people at all different times. This is clearly about how people come into God's kingdom and God's generosity. So if we can't look at it, from a modern perspective that way, what can we take away from this for today's world? I wrote down four things as I start to close. Number one, applies to about every scripture, grace. It's always about grace. God extends grace to all, and the reward for working in God's kingdom is the same for all. And we should be thankful for the grace and mercy we've been offered as we work in God's kingdom. What an incredible job offer. Of all the ones I've accepted, that's the greatest one. It should be for all of us. The day we say yes to that job. Never forget that day. We should make assumptions. We should not make assumptions about the work others are doing in the kingdom. I kind of talked about this a week or two ago. Our eyes on Jesus as the guide. And when our eyes are fully on Jesus, the rest of the world becomes a little dimmer. And as we grow in our faith with Jesus, we'll naturally reach out to other people. People will see that light. But it is about the personal walk. Keeping our eyes on our relationship, not making assumptions about other people. Number three, God is the giver of every good gift and the bestower of grace and mercy to all. And number four, just as the workers knew the deal, we know the deal. 
We accept God's gracious invitation and God's kingdom. We know what that reward will be. It's equal for all. We should focus on our relationship with God in prayer. As we conduct those one-on-ones with God, we know the word one-on-one. As we conduct those with God, we do our on-the-job training with God as God and the Holy Spirit leads us in on-the-job training. And as we receive our performance reviews and that quiet time we have with God and our inspiration. Well, as I do close, the story I told about the judge does remind me that others in this world can judge right or wrong. But those judgments are not final. God is the ultimate judge who offers grace and mercy to all who work in God's kingdom. And let me remind you one more time as I close, God is an equal opportunity and glory. God bless you, friends. If, as you're able, if you could stand.